Our Heavenly Father, we know that there are many apparent sources of wisdom that compete for our attention and tell us that they know how to live life to the full. Please help us this lunchtime to listen to your wisdom and put what we hear into practice. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to page 1184, our reading today is from Colossians, as is the whole series during the summer. Colossians chapter 2, we're beginning at verse 5, which is at the foot of the left-hand side of that page. So, page 1184. Chapter 2, verse 5. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you die to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you are still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Well, thank you very much, and good afternoon to you all today. Whose wisdom do we follow in life? Whose wisdom do we follow? I take it that there are many competing voices out there vying for our attention, vying for that voice which we hear, and upon which we make our decisions. There's news from social media, or maybe the school teacher who had an impact growing up. Maybe our parents, maybe we listen to their wisdom as we go along. Or could I say we listen to the wisdom of the city, the wisdom of the city which promises 
so much as well. Wealth, prosperity, career, health and happiness. That's the dream of the city. Now this series of talks today is based around the idea of high octane life, how to have it all. And it can very often seem, especially when we're working here in the city, that the high octane life is here and now. It is here in the city, going about our work and our lives. The career, the entertainment, the progression, the excitement, live hard, play hard. It can make it quite irresistible as well to be drawn in by those temptations I mentioned. But there's an important point. Even the city, the most magnificent of world financial centers, cannot deliver on everything it promises. And as we look at Paul's letter to, to the Colossians here today, we will see that there, there are many similarities as well uh, in that we put forward human solutions to problems, but these human solutions simply cannot resolve. The book of Colossians is written by the apostle Paul, who was commissioned by Jesus. It's written to a very new, a young church in modern day Turkey in a town called Colossi. It was written in the first century AD, not long after Jesus was around. And although Paul has not personally visited this town, he's heard good things about their strong faith and their love for one another in the church. So he's heard a good report, but there's an important detail. He's also picked up on a concerning, unhelpful, potentially concerning situation which is, which is going on in the town and which he's writing to address. These young Christians are tempted to be led astray from the newfound faith which they have received. They're being tempted away by a heady mixture of human wisdom, religious observance, self-denial, traditions, and worship of spirits and angels. And Paul was partly writing to address a corrective to this potential threat and to derail their faith. And the message is very simple. He says, stick with Jesus, don't listen to the alternatives. Stick with Jesus, not the alternatives. And with that in mind, I'm going to address that overall theme under two headings, which are on the, the service sheet today. The first is we have fullness in Christ, not in human wisdom. And second, we have freedom in Christ, not in human rules. So the first area, we have fullness in Christ, not in human wisdom. I'm going to read from verse 6. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Now, many people say that these two verses really helpfully and accurately sum up the thrust of the whole letter. They're a wonderful way of summarizing what Paul is saying to this church. You've received Christ Jesus as Lord. You've put your trust in him, so carry on. Do what you're doing. Stick with Jesus, firm and established in the faith. This is the salvation you've received, so don't deviate from it. Don't be taken in by the alternatives. Carry on walking with him at the center of your life. And against this wonderful summary statement, Paul then introduces the first of those potential pitfalls I mentioned, the threats to their faith. That's down there in verse eight. He says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So Paul is warning against some of those unhelpful influences which are creeping in and bearing on the church. It's unlikely we're talking about a distinct group of false teachers who are running amok, but rather some people from amongst their own number of converted Christians who are looking for a bit more, who want a bit more out of their Christian experience. They want to get to know God in a fuller way, but ending bits of pagan religion and Judaism to help them achieve that, to feel that better experience of their Christian faith. 
And they've blended together these human things and these divine things and created a, a syncretism of, of different, different religions and spiritualities. And it seems to be this kind of idea which is really drawing them away. It's very misleading and also tempting, as you can see. To put it another way, I thought of it a bit like um, when we're tempted to tinker with something too much. So as I said, they've already received Jesus as Lord and they're tempted to add on a bit more to get a fuller experience of him. I, I, I compared it to um, when you're cooking some food and you've you know, cooked up all your ingredients, it's all tasting, smelling really good, and you throw in an extra ingredient, a bit too much salt or something, and it just ruins the whole dish. You've actually got off worse than when you started. You just try and throw in a little bit more, and it deducts from the whole thing. And that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to add on a bit more, tinker with something which is very good, and potentially ruining the whole thing. Throwing away their faith, and wandering off after alternative forms of spirituality and religious observance. Now, if there was better before, rather than ruining it, Jesus says, stick with what you have. Stick with Jesus. Don't go after the deceit, the human rules, and potentially demonic powers at work. You've already got Jesus. Don't follow the alternatives. And there are definitely parallels there with the city as well. I see it a lot in myself and in those around me. All of us working here can, can I think, appreciate the lure of other things beyond, beyond us. Be we Christians or not Christians, there's always something more we're often striving for, which we think will fulfill us and give us that bit more. In the city, people talk about the golden handcuffs, where you um, get to a certain stage in your career, which I'm probably not there yet, but you get paid such good money and such good bonus that you think, I can't ever leave now. I'm stuck. I'm handcuffed into this job and this city. I've heard people say it to me. They say, I couldn't possibly ever leave finance or the city. I wouldn't get paid enough. And it's a genuine concern. And of course, we have um, mortgages to pay and people to feed. But at the same time, people do speak of this powerful temptation of, in this case, money. And it's very prevalent in the city, I find. The promotions, the perks, the progression. It's so easy to say, I want a bit more of that rather than Jesus. And I can see my heart being lured away by the false promises of what those things claim. The wisdom of, that they say, this will make you a bit more happy. Well, this will give you a fuller Christian experience. Sadly that these things can often displace Jesus, though as the object of our affection if we're Christians. If something is put in the place of him, then he gets pushed to one side. And that new thing, which we see in the city, becomes all-powerful in our lives. So the city provides an alternative way of living a philosophy, a code, a way of doing things, a way of living, an alternative to Christianity, which promises a lot. But rather than talk about the golden handcuffs tying us to the job, we need to detach one from the city and plant that on Jesus and say, I want to be attached to him. He's the one we should be tied to, anchored, so that we don't get lured away with the temptations I just mentioned. Fix those on to Jesus. That's what Paul would say. When someone comes claiming to give us a better experience of God, it can seem very tempting, especially if we're looking for that extra spark. In order to remain, though, to remain with Jesus, it's very simple. Paul said, keep on walking with him. And for us, that means, well, coming back to God's word. There's so much solidity in what God says. Paul speaks a lot about the, the shadows of these other teachings going on, whereas the substance belongs to Christ. And we find the substance in the Bible because it's rock solid, a term of application, and we can know God, our personal savior, through its pages. We don't need to deviate away from it. That's the good news. And meeting up together like we are now, meeting with other Christians helps us, again, to stay on track to stay rooted 
to the scriptures, to the faith as we have received it from other people, helping each other do that as we go along. So I'm personally very encouraged to see so many people here today who are seeking to, to do that, to dig into the word and to stay close to Jesus as you do so. So this is a very real threat for this young church. And the summary statement is so clear. No matter how good it looks, it's not as good as Jesus. You have fullness in him. Fullness is the most deep sense of completion of everything you have in Jesus. And you've already got it. Don't throw it away. Don't change. Verse nine makes the point really well. It says, for in him, Jesus, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. So the, the fullness that Jesus provides is contrasted with the empty deceit of the false teaching swirling around in Colossae. These shadowy elementary teachings which can lure people away. Jesus gives life to the full by comparison. Of course, we're always on the lookout for the best thing to choose. In the fund management world where I work, we often weigh up different investment funds and we say, well, which is the best one to go for? We do it all the time. We, we apply metrics to it. We say, well, this one's got a better return or better information ratio or different things we can apply to them. Tracking error, it's all very boring. But anyway, if you apply two funds side by side, you can see one stands out a mile because usually it is a lot better. On all those boxes, it ticks all of them. And therefore, we would say, well, we want to invest in, in that one when we stack them up against each other. There's no comparison. Well, I should say um, uh, at this point, obviously, returns can go up and down and you can lose more than you invested, <laughs> of course. When they're put side by side, it's easy to determine which is better. And Paul just brings Jesus alongside the false teachers and he says, you've got this in one hand and you're tempted with the other one. It's so obvious which you need, so clear which you need. So stick with Jesus and not the alternatives. Then in verse 11, he reinforces that point. He refers to the Jewish rite of circumcision, which may have been another of those practices which was being advocated at the time to bring people a bit nearer to God. Some people might have said, uh, as a kind of a, a Jewish extension of Jewish teaching, well, you need to have a circumcision in the body now to throw off some of those fleshly behaviors that you're still basting with. Do something physical to your body, that will help you overcome your sin. Do something physical. And it's true, sin is a very great problem which needs dealing with. But they were advocating exactly the wrong method. Well, if sin is a problem and it cuts us off from God, saying we would rather be in the driving seat, there's no way that we can solve that ourselves because we are part of the problem. And so by saying mutilate your body or beat yourself up or do something to yourself to solve it, well, that will just add to the problem and make things worse. There's no way that disengaging from fleshly behavior with physical means will do any good at all. And sin is such a great problem that even being more organized or more self-controlled or more spiritual or, I don't know, more, more into the occult or anything else, that won't help either because sin can't be dealt with by a human solution, something from the world. It has to come from outside. And so that's why Jesus is the only one who can deal with the problem. By laying down his life to wash our hearts clean, he overcomes those spiritual forces which tempt us away. This is not a bodily circumcision it talks about, but it says a circumcision given by Jesus, one of the heart. He washes us clean from the inside, not by doing something to our bodies from the outside. He clears away our past record and sets us free from sin, gives us forgiveness and pays the debt on our account. It talks about the debt which we owe because of our sin, but Jesus deals with it by paying the price in his body. 
So Jesus and his salvation are a way in which we can deal with the problem of our sin. Let's not be deceived, because it's so easy, isn't it, to think that we can deal with that problem other ways, from within ourselves. You can't. You can't. We have fullness in Christ, not in human rituals. So stick with Jesus. Then moving on to the second point, we have freedom in Christ, not in human rules. Again, reinforcing that same big theme of just sticking with what you've got, don't move away. Verse 16 says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with the growth that is from God. There was a temptation then for these people to follow certain religious practices, which would have specified what to eat and drink what to, what uh, festivals to observe, what spiritual things to do. You can see it's all about our actions again. It sounds like people were being encouraged not to eat or drink certain foods at certain times and obey the festivals so they could get that little bit extra from God as if he almost owed them something. They were trying to be devoted, sure, they were, they were doing their best to show up to festivals and trying to get closer, trying to live the high-octane life. But it's so empty in reality. Remember, the substance belongs to Christ. It's mere shadows. It's not the real thing. Just abstinence and festivals. It's, it's not a great way to go. So where these people are saying, do this, do that, Jesus just cuts through. We've done. We've done it. You don't need to carry on trying to get closer to me. Now, of course, it's good sometimes to refrain from certain things uh, if they're causing a problem in our, in our godliness, in our holiness. There's nothing wrong with that. But where people are trying to get a bit more, a bit closer to God, trying to earn something from it, if the attitude is wrong, well, it's no good at all. And Paul says, don't let anyone pass judgment on you on these matters. If you are not joining in with them, don't worry. You're not doing the wrong thing. You don't need them after all because Christ has the substance. And if there's people around you going on in detail about their dreams and their visions and about angels, they're going to feel all puffed up and good about themselves because I've got this dream, I've had this vision, and obviously the people that haven't are going to feel very left out and second class by comparison. You can, you can imagine the picture, can't you? People going on all the time about their wonderful religious, religious experience and thinking, oh, am I meant to have that as well? Or am I missing something? The trouble with this is that when people are insisting on needing to have these things, it immediately creates two tiers of, of Christians. The ones who have the religious experience and the ones that don't. And when you get that division, you're immediately going to get a kind of a Christian hierarchy, a first class and a second class. And the people who are left out are thinking, well, am I even a Christian? Do I have it right? I thought I was just meant to stick with Jesus. But they say this. You can see how dangerous that can be when people are tempted to have this Christianity 2.0, the next, the next level. It's not. It's Christianity minus two, if anything. It takes away. And Paul in verse 20 says that with Christ, Christians have died to the elemental base spirits and practices. So don't go back to them. Why would you even submit to these rules, he said? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. There's no need. You are free in Christ. Freedom comes with the fullness of Christ. So don't be constricted by these human rules they don't deliver on what they promise. So Paul here again is saying, avoid the alternatives. Stick with Jesus. 
whilst they may appear very wise, these practices, these schemes may appear wise, it's but an appearance of wisdom. An appearance, a shadowy grasp of wisdom, but not the real deal. They have no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh, the sinful body, the sinful behavior. These things will do nothing for you, he's saying. Being a nicer person, being more disciplined in our, in our habits will not get you closer to God. It will just make you think you are and you get a shock when you're not. It's highly likely that some people were thinking at the time that following these rules would make themselves better people. And we can do that a lot, can't we? We think, oh, if only I did this or I did that, that would make myself better or closer to God through self-denial, through hard work, through severity. Avoid. Avoid it. And I'm sure there's some of us today who also maybe aren't followers of the Lord Jesus and would say, well, Christianity, yeah, it's all about just following rules and doing, just doing boring festivals. And that's what it seems like, seems like to me. It's about those Christians over there who feel very superior because they do all their spiritual stuff. Yeah, I can see sometimes where people are coming from, yeah. But actually, it's completely wrong to say that. Christians have the truth. Christians have the solution to their greatest problem, a problem we mentioned earlier about the sin and, and the flesh. Only Jesus can solve that truly, once for all, in his death on the cross. No amount of human endeavor or hard work will ever be able to get us to the same place. And so for those here who aren't following Jesus, I would say, look to him to get the solution to our greatest problem. Don't be sidetracked by all the stuff around it, the things which can get in the way. It's much more important to focus on the source of our salvation, the substance, not the shadow. Jesus, not the alternatives. So whose wisdom will we follow? Stick with Jesus and not the alternatives. Let me pray. Dear Lord our Father, thank you so much that we have fullness and freedom in Christ. Please help us where we are tempted away by the world and the flesh. Please help us to stick close to Jesus because only he can deal with our greatest problem of sin. Amen.